Madam Tutu, this is Rajavi, all of our friends and colleagues, all of you here today, and I know our brothers and sisters in Camp Horia listening to us tonight. And let me start my first uh, message to you. Um, we know how much you are suffering. We know that there are hostages that have been taken from you, which are being kept, and God knows what else, by the Iraqi authorities at the assistance and with the complicity of the Iranian authorities. I want to express, but I want to express it also in the form of our regrets and our personal apologies. As one of my colleagues said, we did not just work with our Department of State to persuade you and your leadership here in Paris to move from Ashraf to Liberty. We came to Paris, four of us who are here today, we came to Paris on our own time, at our own expense, and at the request of our United States Department of State. And we sat down with Madame Rajavi, with Ambassador Kobler, and we made the case. We persuaded you that it was in your interest, and indeed critical to your safety, to move from Ashraf to Liberty. You know, I spent most of my years as a FBI agent, a police officer, and later as a prosecutor. I have never seen a crime scene, a massacre scene, as the ones that we saw today. I have never seen scenes like this, where innocent men and women were tied and tethered and shot and executed at point blank range. This is outrageous murder and genocide of the highest degree. You saw those guys marching in. They, they weren't just casually approaching. They were marching in uniformed, disciplined, tactical maneuvers. We also know that Camp Ashraf was surrounded by Iraqi brigades and all types of electronic and physical surveillance. There is no way that strangers could get into that camp, massacre 52 people over the many hours that it took to accomplish those crimes, and leave undetected. And contrary, not just the common sense and the forensics that you can see, but all you have to do is go on the internet the mullahs and the regime bragged about these murders, welcomed these murders. It is absolutely impossible that those could have occurred without the direct command, influence, and complicity of the Iraqi leadership supported by the Iranian regime. You know, I have three sons who wore the uniform of the United States. I wore the uniform of the United States Army. We know that our military services, our colleagues who are not here with us today, promised, promised in writing, that the safety of the residents, not, now, not only of Camp Ashraf, but now of Camp Haria, would be guaranteed and protected by the United States. Where is the anger and where is the outrage in our government, and particularly our Department of State, about the non-fulfillment of that promise, the violation of that promise, which has resulted in mass genocide and could easily result in additional mass genocide. It is unbelievable to us that we have not heard the outrage from our current Secretary of State, our prior Secretary of State, who takes credit for delisting this organization whose listing was an outrageous act of appeasement to the Iranian regime when it happened, uh, where is the anger and where is the outrage uh, from any of these people who were directly involved in making these promises and particularly persuasive in having the move of these residents to a place where they are now in almost grave danger? In addition to some of the things that my colleagues have asked for, what I ask for tonight is a outrage and a proactive, intensive commitment by our government to rescue these hostages. So in addition to all the other things that have been asked for, the other thing that we should focus on is the bringing to justice, which is something that all of us here, at least the Americans, have been in the business of doing for many years. Bringing to justice 
the war criminals and the people who have committed these crimes. Another fact which we should keep in mind in terms of any negotiations is a formal report and charge in October of 2006 by a prosecutor named Nisman, who was an Argentine ambassador and investigator. In an indictment, in a criminal instrument, he stated that the decision to approve the bombing, this is the EMEA bombing, was ultimately made by the Supreme Leader, Khomeini, but other senior members of the government were part of the decision, including then President Rafaz Jani, Foreign Minister Velayati, Intelligent Minister Falahi, and very interestingly, the National Security Council Secretary Hassan Roumani. We should not forget, as we do negotiations, that many, many matters are open and many matters of war crimes and genocide have to be addressed. The only reason they ever showed up for a negotiation was not because they wanted to solve strategic problems, but because they were on the brink of disaster. They were on the ropes as they had never been on the ropes before in 34 years. The most important thing is what, Madam Rajavi, you have done as the leadership of the one player, the one entity in this whole process, including the United States government, that has kept your promises, that has enunciated a charter of freedom, which has effectively fought and countered the terrorist regime in Tehran, and has set forth a roadmap for liberty for the future of this great nation and its imprisoned people. The United States needs to follow that lead. The organization here is a freedom organization. Its 10-point charter of freedom, particularly for women and equality and nonviolence, is a model charter of liberty and freedom for any organization or any great leader in the world. What has to be done is the United States has to fulfill its promises. You can't make a promise and break it and keep your honor. You can't make a promise and ignore it. You can't draw red lines in the sand and walk away from them. We can't become a country that's running out of red paint, so we can't draw any more red lines. We have no credibility when we try to talk tough because our record betrays that. We go back just a very short period of time. Forget about Chamberlain in 1938. And you know, Pearl Harbor, the day before, we were negotiating with the Japanese ambassador and the people in the State Department thought they had a promise by the Empire of Japan not to increase its expansion and aggressiveness in the Pacific. So we have many, many things to look at, but we, we have not done well, speaking as a law enforcement officer and speaking as someone who ran a counterterrorism agency for many years, we have not done a good job with our credibility because we have backed away from trouble and we have broken our promises. And in this particular matter, we have broken our promises and we have backed away from terror. So when they blew up Kobar Towers in 1996, killing 19 Americans, we did nothing. When they blew up our embassies, in 1998 in East Africa. We indicted some people, we did not much more. When they blew up the USS Coal in 2000, we did nothing. We have a history of backing away from what Rudy Giuliani so effectively said was our American character and our American credibility for doing the right thing and for facing up to bullies and for facing up to terrorists. Something that we learned as kindergartners and as children, and which children learn every day. With terrorists, there is no negotiating unless you have a firm hand and you're willing to use that firm hand effectively and credibly. We have undermined substantially our credibility, and we undermine it every day that our promises fail to protect the 3,100 hostages who are at huge risk and daily risk. So what the United States has to do simply is keep its promise. We should have planes landing at Baghdad airport. We should bring every one of those individuals back to the United States and protect them as we promised to protect them.
we should we should scream we should scream for an international commission to investigate the war crimes being committed by the president of Iraq aided and abetted by many other people in different countries. We should ensure that all these past cases that I talk about don't fall off the table, don't fall off the agenda as we try to negotiate some grandiose deal uh, which will win the peace. Because you can't win the peace with terrorists and you can't legitimatize a regime that has killed not just hundreds of Americans but hundreds of thousands of Iranians and other people all over the world. And if we don't get that right, uh, there will be as many disastrous consequences as there were in 1938 and after Pearl Harbor. Thank you very much.